Hello and welcome to West Musings, 10-minute museum talks brought to you by Wells Fargo, along with Hawkins, Delafield, and Wood. And we're here this evening at the Computer History Museum with thanks to box.org. The recording this evening and the post-production are brought to us with thanks to the contributed work of Soulstream Studios. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Scott Manning Stevens, a member of the Akwesasne Mohawk Nation, and also the director of Native American Studies at Syracuse University. Dr. Stevens. Sego, Skanagoa. I start with a traditional Mohawk greeting by way of acknowledging the original custodians of this land we're on the Ohlone people and their descendants living in the Bay Area. I'm delighted to be here. Um, though not a denizen of the West, I teach and study the art of the American West in Syracuse, New York, and I teach a popular course with a colleague there called Cowboys and Indians, which everyone likes. Um, but I want to talk to you about museums in general because for many Native Americans, museums are a problematic space. How should this be? Well, I think back in my own childhood and like many little kids, the first thing that made me want to go to a museum was dinosaurs, right? And we went to the museum, in my case, in Albany. This is a picture from the field. The State Historical Museum, Natural History Museum, and there were the dinosaurs. But to my surprise, there were the Indians dioramas, artifacts. What were our people doing in a museum with dinosaurs and minerals, right? And it didn't take long to figure it out. Dinosaurs, Indians. Dinosaurs, Indians. We're being treated as things extinct, right? In that real Indians was the underlying feeling. We had been marooned in the past by museums. Stuck in a forever time long ago in which we served as a kind of at best romanticized prologue for US history. Not to mention the bad old days, the grave robbing, the human remains, right? the stolen artifacts put on display, decontextualized, alienated from their people, and far from their homelands in major urban centers like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. This began to change, of course, through two legislative acts of Congress that seem unrelated but work together. The first would be the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988, which allowed for the creation of casinos on Indian territory. You'll hear me say Indian and Native American interchangeably. It's the way it is. They're all misnomers. Right? Um, and so the Indian Regulatory Gaming Act allowed Native nations that chose to have gaming funding streams that had never been in their community before. Suddenly, there were some tribes, nations, making a lot of money. For instance, the Pequot with their museum in Connecticut funded by the, the money from Foxwoods Casino. Now, before, there had been what were called tribal museums, and they were a hodgepodge of collections on our various territories, sometimes in people's homes, sometimes in a former retail space, but nothing like the state-of-the-art building that went up in Foxwoods um, proximity. And one of the questions the Pequot people had to answer was, what are you going to put in it? Because so little of their material culture had survived 300 years of sustained colonialism. And so paradoxically, they chose to go back to our old friend, the diorama. <laughs> they built this amazing series of dioramas modeled on people from their own community and at a scale of a, you know, a human scale, where you could finally do what every kid wanted to do with dioramas, go into the diorama. You walk through it. 
and you walk through their history, because yes, we love our ancient history, but we walk through our history and see that it changes. That you walk through the difficulties of the 19th century, the plight of the 20th century, and all of these things are represented. We are not, we don't stop in 1630. And that was their way of kind of inserting into a story that had before been truncated into the 17th century and bring it up to the modern day. Also making sure that there were plenty of spaces for talks, exhibitions, traveling exhibitions, performances, films, etc. It became a very dynamic center and remains so. The other act that allowed for a change in thinking about museums was the 1990 Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, known as NAGPRA, now 25 years old. NAGPRA addressed some of those dark sins of the past in forcing institutions to return inappropriately acquired or stolen artifacts, human remains, etc., and began to address that long problem. It didn't mean that it fixed everything immediately. We have long memories in our communities. And so a museum still carries a certain burden in our communities. You'll find very few of these institutions use the name museum. It's almost like an allergy that we have based on this legacy. We tend to call them cultural centers. Now, two of my favorite that I've been to, and I visit a lot of them, one is Tomaslik Cultural Center of the Confederated Tribes of the Imatilla that opened in 1998 because of their casino money up in Pendleton, Oregon area, which has this gorgeous site-specific building that mirrors the landscape, the rolling landscape of the Palouse, and allows them to tell their story in their way, right? And what I loved about being there was when they're showing, you know, this model, life-size model of a traditional dwelling, you are in the country in which it was built, for which it was made. And there's a kind of site-specific quality that suddenly these things make sense because you're not looking at them in a big alabaster building in New York City, right? You can look outside and imagine how these function, and there are some built outside. Similarly, the artifacts that are on display are ones with which the curators, the native curators in the museum have a deep and intimate knowledge of these items. And again, they are in situ, right? They are in the places they're made and you have a better understanding of the materials that go into them, the purposes for which they were created in that environment, how they're part of a total ecology of life there. And seeing them in this way, I found very profoundly moving and I think the next one I went to that was equally, made an equal impact on me was the Zebuwing Cultural Center in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. It's right in the center of the lower state, part of the state. And it is the Saginaw Chippewa Reservations Cultural Center where they explain, you know, an aspect of Anishinaabe culture. They use similar diorama-like features but again, it is a history that goes throughout their time. And I think what most profoundly moved me here was I went in knowing very little about Anishinaabe culture. I had some basic historical outline of them as a people. But when I finished this tour, and it took hours to really read and think about these things, I not only knew the story they were telling us about themselves, but I saw that it was a way of understanding how they make sense of their history. We all have these complicated, difficult histories of dispossession and loss and removal, et cetera. How do we tell that story? It's not merely a counter-narrative. It is a narrative of how we understand ourselves. And that's, I think, the greatest gift that this museum can give. It was also made sense of a lot of intercultural exchange, complex things, to see how they look back on it and understand those pivot parts of their history. So the two things I came away thinking I wanted to 
emphasize in this talk was one, visit these type of institutions. They're not necessarily near a big city. They're usually going to be on one of our reservations. But take the time, especially as museum professionals, visit them, talk to the curators there, and really think about possible collaboration or how that experience can turn into a mutual and ongoing dialogue into the future. And the other thing that really strikes me in these museums, and all museums, is the unusual burden that museums have when it comes to Native American history. Remember that nationally, the average age that children stop learning formally in school about Native Americans is fourth grade. Eight or nine years old, if that's the last time you're taught anything about Native peoples, that's going to be a very different story than the story we would tell adults. So museums are going to be really one of the only places that adults encounter information about our rich and various cultures. And that is a heavy burden, but one I think should be exciting. We've heard about risk, we've heard about th new ways of thinking about these things, and I encourage everyone to approach Native Americans and museums in the same way. Nyawe Goa, thank you. <laughs>